gives me the uh, opportunity to invite our moderator for this morning. Larry Luxner, an American journalist, was born and raised in Miami. He first came to Israel in the early 1980s as a college student and freelance journalist, writing for the Fort Lauderdale News, Gainesville Sun, and other Florida newspapers. He eventually developed expertise in Latin America, moving to Puerto Rico, traveling to and fitting feature stories from across the Caribbean as a stringer for the Miami Herald. Later based in Washington, D.C., Larry established his own newsletter, South America Reporter, in 1995, and later acquired Cuba News, which he edited and published for 12 years. Expanding his reporting career to Eastern Europe, Africa, and Asia, he has reported from more than 100 countries, including Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, China, Georgia, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, Turkey, and the Maldives. He's interviewed everyone from Fidel Castro to Angelina Jolie to the chief rabbi of Kazakhstan. Larry made Aliyah from the, from the Washington area on January 12th, exactly eight days before President Trump's inauguration. We have had the honor of working with Larry in the past. The Israel Asia Center has um, collaborated with him uh, uh, in his uh, different writings, and we are very lucky to have him this morning moderate this panel. So please, Larry. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Boker tov lekulam. Buenos dias a todos. An yam hashim nikat. That's the extent of my Korean. <laughs> I want to thank Michal for that lovely introduction to my longtime Rebecca Zeffert, founder of the Israel Asia Center, who could not be here this morning, and to our three expert panelists who are here, along with distinguished ambassadors and diplomats from a dozen countries ranging from Angola to Zambia. And of course, a big thanks to all of you, our audience for joining us here in Tel Aviv for what I promise will be an interesting discussion on a subject rarely, if ever before, discussed in a public forum, the North Korean nuclear threat. But most of all, I want to thank Donald Trump for making today's event more timely than we could have ever dreamed of. As Michal pointed out, the 45th president is wrapping up his visit to Japan and preparing to fly to South Korea tomorrow as part of a marathon 12-day trip whose agenda also includes China, Vietnam, and the Philippines. It's the longest visit to Asia by any American president since George Herbert Walker Bush visited the region in 1992 and got, shall we say, sick during a state dinner. <laughs> Domestic scandals and investigations aside, the issue of North Korea hangs over all of Trump's trip like a dark mushroom cloud. During his visit, the president intends to meet his friend and Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, to, to discuss this problem, as he calls it. But the simple fact is this. At no time since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis have ordinary Americans been so worried about a nuclear confrontation. <clears throat> Kim Jong-un's warning that he'll rain hydrogen bombs on major U.S. cities and Trump's incessant tweeting about fat little rocket man and total destruction of North Korea has completely overshadowed more nuanced talk about negotiations and diplomacy. No wonder, perhaps, that according to a recent poll taken after Trump's fire and fury speech, 46% of Republicans said they would support a preemptive strike against North Korea. So what does all this mean for Israel and the Middle East, which has plenty of its own nuclear threats to contend with? Here to help sort it out are three top experts in the field. Dr. Emily Landau is a senior research fellow and head of the Arms Control and Regional Security Program at INSS, the Institute for National Security Studies, which is affiliated with Tel Aviv University. As her bio states, Dr. Landau has published and lectured widely on nuclear proliferation, arms control, and regional security dynamics in the Middle East. In 2012, she published Decade of Diplomacy, Negotiations with Iran and North Korea, and the Future of Nuclear Nonproliferation. Dr. Landau appears frequently in the Israeli media, and two years ago, Forbes magazine named her one of Israel's 50 most influential women in recognition of her work on security issues. We also have Dr. Alon Lefkowitz, coordinator of the Asian Studies program at Bar Ilan University and researcher at that university's Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. Dr. Lefkowitz has written no less than 20 papers for academic journals, including the Korean Journal of Defense Analysis, International Relations of the Asia-Pacific, and Military and Strategic Affairs. 
Dr. Lefkowitz's 2005 doctoral dissertation from Hebrew University in Jerusalem analyzed the defense policies of South Korea, Japan, and the Philippines, all allies of the United States. Joining us via Skype from Seoul is Dr. Daniel Pinkston, a lecturer in international relations with Troy University. Before that, he was Northeast Asia Deputy Project Director at the International Crisis Group in Seoul and Director of the East Asia Nonproliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies in Monterey, California. Dr. Pinkston, who has a master's degree in Korean studies from Yonsei University, as well as a PhD in international affairs in the University of California in San Diego, was also a Korean linguist at the U.S. Air Force and has lived off and on in South Korea for the past 19 years. As you can imagine, there's a lot to talk about this morning, and I have questions of my own, as will many of you. After our Q&A, we'll open up the floor to the audience. But when we do, please remember three things. State your name and affiliation, if any, since this event is being recorded for posterity and Facebook. Second, please ask a question, don't make a statement. And finally, keep your questions brief and to the point, since our time is limited. Ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome our panelists. almost dinner time in Seoul. I'd like to start with you, Dr. Pinkston. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm great. From your vantage point on the ground, only 30 miles south of the DMZ, how does the situation look to you And uh, as South, Pro south Korea prepares to welcome President Trump? What's the mood like? Are people nervous about the hype and the security and rhetoric, or does life go on as normal? It's going on pretty normal. Everything is stable. People are busy with their lives. We have to pay the bills. Uh, looking at North Korea, this period is a time when they're uh, finishing their yearly uh, plans. So there's a lot of focus on uh, production in factories and so forth. And uh, military tensions are quite low right at the moment. What is it, uh, what's the mood in terms of President Trump's arrival, uh, pending arrival? What are the expectations of the South Korean people? I think people's exp expectations are quite low. <laughs> I think people realize that the relationship is greater than any one individual. So the relationship has weathered turbulence in the past when there have, when there's been, uh, uh, personal tensions or personal disagreements between uh, leaders. There's been times of uh, trade friction and other problems, but the alliance has been very resilient. And I think a lot of people are nervous about uh, Trump, his commitment to the, the region and the credibility of U.S. commitments to the alliance. But for the most part, I think we'll uh, weather the problems or potential problems. Dr. Lefkowitz, uh, you've spent at least 15 years studying North Korea and its nuclear program, including the economic impact of this program, not only on the North, but on South Korea as well. What are the implications for Israel if North Korea is able to bring its nuclear program to fruition? Uh, I agree 100% what he said about, yeah, it's okay. I, I agree with, uh, with him what he said, what's going on in, in South Korea. I must say that every time that I go to South Korea, people in Israel are concerned, is it safe to go to South Korea? And when I go back to Israel, I'm always saying, are you sure you want to go back to Israel because it's not safe here? <laughs> so uh, it's a problematic. Our biggest concern in Amory is, is the expert in Israel is that in North Korea, if the sanctions will increase, North Korea is to, it will be willing to, to offer its technologies as, as it did in the, in the case of Syria, uh, developing a, a nuclear reactor, uh, willing uh, to to sell uh, to everyone who's wanted, wanted to buy uh, the missiles and the nuclear uh, uh, program. And uh, our biggest fear would be that if they will offer a backdoor options for Iran is to develop the nuclear bomb for them uh, without breaching the, the, uh, the agreement that Iran signed. Could you uh, just elaborate on that a bit about uh, the uh, North Korean cooperation with Israel's enemies? Uh, this is one of the biggest concerns that North Korea is, uh, is selling, assisting, uh, for example, Syria, selling uh, missiles, developing a nuclear program, selling uh, uh, light ammunition to all the terrorist organizations in the region. In the old days, they used to sell to other states, uh, for example, Egypt, 
uh, even now they're selling to, to Egypt. Uh, so it, it's, it's a huge concern for Israel because uh, Israel needs to uh, needs the, the U.S. to intercept some of the uh, this, uh, shipments to the Middle East, or if, they, if the Americans miss the shipments, we just bombard them on the way from Syria to Lebanon. Mm. Dr. Lando, uh, you're an expert in the subject of nonproliferation and the strategic significance of nuclear weapons and deterrence. You've also written extensively on Iran's nuclear program. Uh, I'm hoping you can address the relevance of North Korea's nuclear threat to the Iranian situation. How are they similar and how are they different? Well, okay. Um, Iran and North Korea are very different states in many, many respects. Um, and I don't think anyone who's trying to compare them in the nuclear realm uh, should, you know, make a mistake and think that these two states are very similar. They're not. They have different strategies. They have different tactics. Uh, they have different motives uh, in the nuclear realm. But there's one important feature that they have in common, and that is that they are both determined proliferators, uh, nuclear proliferators. They're both states that started their nuclear programs while members of the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So they are both states that joined an international treaty, made a commitment not to work on a military nuclear program, broke that commitment, worked on it. North Korea, of course, left the NPT in 2003, but it was after they had already begun work on their program, um, and actually abused the NPT as a cover for their military aims in the nuclear realm. They're both highly determined. Um, as I said, they both abuse the weaknesses of the NPT, the loopholes that are unfortunately in the NPT. And in this sense, uh, the international community that's grappling with both of these proliferators is facing a similar challenge. Um, and so where I really see the direct relevance of the North Korean case for the Iranian case is understanding the limits of diplomacy as a strategy for stopping a determined proliferator. Okay, diplomacy has been the strategy of choice for North Korea for 25 years, and it has failed. North Korea is a nuclear state. It can already threaten its neighbors with nuclear weapons, and the big change that came last July was uh, North Korea indicating that they are probably very close to being able to hit the mainland U.S. with a long-range ballistic missile. Um, so it's been a failure of diplomacy. There were agreements along the way, but North Korea breached those agreements. Is this a, uh, a, 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 a policy of, you mentioned, strategic patience under the Obama administration? Well, strategic patience was the specific policy of the Obama administration. All it meant was the Obama administration was saying to North Korea, look, you know, we had this deal, you broke the deal, we've had five years of talks in the six-party talks, we haven't reached the denuclearization that we want to reach. When you get serious, you know my number, call me and we can talk. Until then, I'm not doing anything more to try to get you to the table. And that lasted for eight years, and North Korea used those years to conduct four more nuclear tests. So it wasn't very successful strategic patience. But let me just make the link to Iran. Uh, so the issue here is to seriously consider diplomacy <coughs> as a strategy for stopping a determined proliferator. And I would say at least we have a huge question mark here, if not an exclamation point, that diplomacy has failed. Iran, it's still an open question, but we certainly see indications that diplomacy is, has not been as successful as was hoped for. We have the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. It's flawed. There are holes there. Um, and uh, the big fear is that in 10 years, we could end up facing Iran 
that is very similar to North Korea today. And then everyone will say, you know, we try, we tried diplomacy, we negotiated, we had a deal, Iran broke the deal, what can we do? Iran is a nuclear state. And my point is, there, is, there are things that can be done, but they need to be done now. One thing Iran and North Korea do have in common is that not too long ago, both were on the State Department's list of terrorist supporting states. Now, as I understand it, in 19, uh, it, during the Bush administration, North Korea was removed from that list, uh, and that left only Cuba, Iran, and Sudan, and Syria. Uh, Cuba was later removed by the Obama administration, and now uh, Trump is talking about putting uh, both back on that list, Cuba and North Korea. Does that list make any difference? And this question is for you and for both uh, you and, and Dan. The American guy. <laughs> the expert. That, does it matter if a country is on the State Department list of terrorist supporting it, states? It, it, uh, well, it's a title. Oh, sorry. The floor is yours. Well, it, it matters, but I, I just want to correct one thing on the Obama administration policy and what strategic patience, strategic patience was. It was a bargaining strategy in the six-party talks. So in that case, the, the it was based upon the best alternative to a negotiated settlement, or the bat or the fallback position. So in that in that case, the U.S. and its allies were in a better position than North Korea in case of no agreement. We were not in any rush to sign a suboptimal or a flawed agreement. We were not desperate for that. The actual policy is deterrence and containment. And we're doing that every day. We've done it for decades, and it's been working pretty well. I look out my window here. There's no war. So the actual policy is deterrence and containment. The bargaining strategy was uh, strategic patience because we had a superior position. Dr. Landa, did you want now, to comment on it? Uh, yeah, well, it oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. And then just on the terrorist, terrorism, there's a statutory, uh, statutory criteria. So they have to meet the legal standard. I'm not a specialist in that, but I know that they have to uh, show or there must be evidence of persistent uh, support for international terrorism. There's arguments for that. Uh, some people have pointed to the Otto Warmbier case, uh, who was detained and uh, died after he came back uh, to the U.S. Uh, very recently. And also the use of uh, VX nerve agent to kill uh, Kim Jong-nam, who was Kim Jong-un's uh, half-brother in an international airport, and I think that's much more compelling reason that that type of activity uh, could be used to, uh, you know, as an argument to place them back on the terrorist list. But how relevant is being on that list? Does it make a difference? Will it deter countries from taking actions against uh, other countries? Well, I think it triggers some automatic actions that, that in uh, international financial institutions and so forth, how the U.S. has to vote uh, they cannot approve any um, financing or development aid or anything like that. But basically, there's none of that anyway, so it's more symbolic than, um, than anything else. Okay. Dr. Landa, did you want to respond to uh, the strategic yeah. patients? Well, look, uh, the six-party talks ended in December 2008. So that was after Obama had been elected, but it was before he became president. So there were no six-party talks when Obama was inaugurated as President of the United States. Therefore, it was not part of the six-party talks. It was a strategy that uh, had to do with the six-party talks in the sense that, as I said before, it was the administration saying to North Korea, we want to go back to the six-party talks, but we're not going to do it if you're not serious. The fact that there's deterrence and containment was really not relevant. That's true. There is deterrence and containment. And by the way, when we get to Trump, I think this is what we're seeing with the Trump administration. But that wasn't, the strategic patience was in particular vis-a-vis -vis the negotiation option. That's very clear. Can I, can I ask you a question? If not diplomacy, what do you offer? Bombarding North Korea, increasing uh, sanctions, What's no, well, I don't know what I would offer, but I can uh, I can analyze what I see on the ground. And what I see on the ground is that um, we're seeing what you can call a deterrence dance. I don't want to make light of it by calling it a dance, but what I mean by dance is that we're seeing interaction between uh, the United States and North Korea that is establishing a new 
deterrent relationship in the new reality that emerged in July of this year. The fact that North Korea will soon have, or maybe already has, nobody has the definitive answer, long-range missiles that can hit major cities in the United States, that's a game changer. I believe any president of the United States that was president in July this year would have reacted pretty much the same as the Trump administration. Uh, you can argue about the words, fire and fury, a different president would choose different words, but if you paid attention, um, Secretary of Defense Mattis <coughs> made similar deterrence statements. He got less flack because he's not President Trump. But the idea in all of these statements was to say to North Korea, in the face of this new reality, we are strengthening our deterrent threat. In other words, don't even think about lobbing a nuclear missile at the United States. This is, it's an unstable situation. It's not a good situation. And we, we're not happy that North Korea has advanced so far. But I think what we're seeing is an attempt to create new rules of the game in order to deal with the new reality that has emerged because of North Korea. It's a North Korea-driven dynamic. Uh, last month, um, the intelligence minister, Israel Katz, said in Japan that Iran must be stopped today so that it doesn't become the North Korea of tomorrow. And he urged the Japanese government to support revisions to the uh, six-party talks with Iran. And uh, Dr. Lefkowitz, what do you say about that? Well, there was uh, Israel Katz, Benjamin Netanyahu, everyone said that we don't want to uh, duplicate uh, in our region. Uh, there's a disagreement between Israel and Asia and, and members of the Six Party Talks, what should be done uh, with Iran. And this is, uh, I would say, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest obstacles that the, the Israeli government faces to convince the members uh, of the agreement with Iran that uh, Iran is on its way to become a nuclear state. For them, as long as Iran obeys with the agreement, uh, we can uh, rest in peace. But uh, on the long run, they will face a problem. As Emily said, they, uh, they have a goal. Uh, uh, ten years later, they will be a nuclear state. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, if when Trump said, I want to tear the agreement, the Europeans said, don't do it. We want the agreement. Don't change the rules of the game. But then you can also come back and say, uh, all right, we, we don't want the agreement, but what do you propose in its absence? Uh, the fact is that, uh, that there is some verification now. Without an agreement, there would be no way to verify what, what no. Iran is doing. But nobody's right. talking about not having a, a, an agreement. I mean, uh, Trump made Well, some state. members of Congress are certainly... Well, no, but that. I mean, the, the administration, and we heard uh, Trump on the 13th of October, uh, unveiling U.S. Iran policy. It was a long-awaited <laughs> policy. It took them nine months, I think, to get this policy together. Um, but what the President said was that the United States um, is a decertifying, okay? It's not willing to certify because it does not believe that this is a really in U.S. national security interest. However, this does not signal leaving the JCPOA. Um, and what he said was that if he's not able to cooperate with allies, international allies and allies in the United States, he wants to change legislation through Congress, then he might have no choice but to leave the deal. But that is a kind of threat that I think was directed mainly to European allies and to Congress, saying to them, please cooperate on the changes that I want to do in order to strengthen the deal, not do away with the deal, to strengthen the deal. Because if I'm not able to do that, I'll have no choice but to leave the deal. So uh, there might be you know, people that, uh, and Trump himself, of course, on the campaign trail, said that he wants to rip up the deal. But since he has yeah. become president, that rhetoric took very much backstage and in the forefront is this idea of maybe renegotiating, although I don't see the leverage for renegotiating, but certainly doing whatever can be done to strengthen those aspects of the JCPOA that can be strengthened. And there are aspects that can be strengthened just through U.S.-European agreement. Without having to rewrite the Without whole. having okay. to renegotiate. Except for the sunset provisions, that will be a problem. <laughs> that will require renegotiation. But we've already seen 
indication at least from France and the UK that they are willing to look again at the sunset provisions. Everyone understands that this kind of deal that has an expiration date is a big problem. Dr. Pinkston, um, one of the biggest issues, uh, of course, is China and its uh, supposed influence over the regime in Pyongyang. Um, contrary to the views of other actors in this drama, the Chinese uh, seem to have neither the ability nor the will to want to sway Kim Jong-un. Um, there are obviously historical and geographical reasons for this, which many Americans don't understand. And I'm wondering if possibly you could enlighten us on that, since you are so close to the situation. And given, what, uh, given those limitations, what can the president hope to really accomplish when he meets his Chinese counterpart in Beijing later this week? Well, China will act in its own national interests. They've stated their preferences uh, many times for a long time. The first is no war. This is on the Korean Peninsula. No war, no instability or chaos. And then the third is uh, no nuclear weapons. So um, their preferences are very clear. But you can't get uh, denuclearization without instability, chaos, or war. So I believe that domestic politics matter, the type of regime, and the, the coalition of supporters matter, and the state identity uh, matter. So uh, for North Korea to denuclearize, it would require fundamental changes in the regime, in the coalition of supporters, and state identity it would be a revolutionary change. And uh, it's difficult to foster a, a revolution or to take down the, the regime. And the second is to uh, disarm North Korea by force, and that's really worse than the, than the problem. It would unleash all of the, the things we're trying to avoid. So uh, China's not going to do that. They will punish North Korea. Uh, they will apply pressure. When other states in the region uh, engage in behavior that China does not like, they will uh, punish or penalize that state for a while and then go back to uh, business as usual. We saw that with uh, the issue surrounding the FAD deployment here in South Korea. We saw, we've saw seen it with um, relations with Vietnam in the South China Sea, and also with North Korea. They will apply pressure after North Korea conducts a missile test or a nuclear test, and after they've made their point, then they will uh, return to uh, business as usual. Is it business as usual? What do you, what do you both think? Is, does China have really influence, and if so, is it willing to use that influence? In some cases, and uh, you mentioned the, the issue of the start, the missile defense system that the Americans and the South Koreans deployed in South Korea, it cost billions of dollars uh, to the South Koreans because the, the Chinese were not happy with the, the system that can see what, what's going on in, in China. And uh, since uh, the middle of March 2017, uh, China said voluntarily, uh, they didn't pressure anyone, uh, organized tours from China to uh, South Korea are not allowed. And, uh, uh, on an average, every, ch every Chinese tourist spends about 3,000 bucks in South Korea, and it means millions, uh, about uh, six, about, about eight million uh, Chinese tourists come to, to South Korea, so the, 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 uh, the, Ameri no, the South Korean were paying huge price because the Chinese were not happy. So now, this has had a devastating effect on the economy? Because yeah, of the, uh, yeah, well, uh, some of the uh, uh, South Korean companies in, in, in China had to close their businesses. So it's uh, what the American Chinese would say. It's a harmonized uh, way of saying to South Korea, "Don't mess with us." And uh, now they're tr trying to get back to business, but the price that South Korea are paying, and in a way, uh, uh, the South Korean president, President Moon, is facing a, a problem. On the one side, he has Trump, President Trump that pushes him to go to one direction, and on the other hand, he has uh, the Chinese Xi Jinping is pressuring him to be uh, uh, less hostile against China. And his policy is trying to find a new way to negotiate with North Korea, but North Korea, Kim Jong-un, does, no does not want to talk to him. He wants to talk to the Americans. Uh, so he, in a way, he has an uh, X-22. Uh, There's no love lost here between the North Koreans and Chinese. I mean, people think that they're uh, strong allies, but... Yeah, they're strong allies, but I, I, I don't agree that uh, the Chinese, well, they don't like Kim Jong-un. They would prefer someone else, but they can't change the... Uh, the leadership. Right. So they're trying once in a while to, to tell them, you crossed the line, you breached uh, our agreement. For, uh, so what you see, on the one hand, the Chinese are increasing the sanctions 
and all North Korea trying to obey the, uh, the pressure that the Americans want. But on the other hand, the, the trade between North Korea and China increases, so we have a, I, a dual game. I yeah. think for years it was some kind of common knowledge, right? When you, when you want to negotiate with a determined proliferator, your big problem is leverage, right? You need leverage to force that proliferator to change course, and this is not easy. Um, and they try with sanctions, and we saw, I think, with, with Iran, we saw 2012, the biting sanctions finally brought the Iranians to the table. Then the problems came in the negotiation. But in the North Korean case, um, for years people have looked to China as the answer, sort of, right? China is North Korea's lifeline. If they cut the lifeline, this will, you know, cause major change in terms of North Korea at the negotiating table. But what was found throughout the years, and this is not new, is that the Chinese do not want to cut the lifeline, not because of any alliance with North Korea, but for two uh, things that they fear in particular, that you know, if North Korea implodes, if they cut that lifeline, North Korea implodes, they have a massive influx of refugees, which they're not interested in, and they have the U.S. military on their doorstep. So those are two outcomes that the Chinese are not interested in happening. And this has been the same dynamic that has been going on for years. It's not something new with this administration. Trump tried to talk to the Chinese, tried to change it. But the answer, I don't think, is going to come from China. In fact, I think there's no answer that will uh, bring North Korea at this late stage to denuclearize. This is not going to happen. So and what that's why we see things moving in the direction of deterrence, and that's why it's so important to stop a determined proliferator before they cross the threshold, because once they are a military nuclear state, the idea that they will denuclearize after they paid such a massive price, put all the energy you know, into building that up, then they're going to denuclearize, this absolutely makes no sense. So then Donald Trump is going to come and leave Beijing empty-handed, he's not going to get what he wants, will he get some kind of symbolic gesture from the Chinese, or will he get some real, uh, real commitment? I'm sure they will say we support your policy. We, as I mentioned, that we we don't like a North Korea, a nuclearized uh, Korean Peninsula. We want to denuclearize, but we want to do it uh, for you. It, it's almost impossible. What I think is that the North Korean would be willing to negotiate once they get the certificate that they have a, a, a working ICBM, a hydrogen bomb, and then they will be willing to go to a, to a negotiation table to offer technical maneuvers. Without becoming, uh, without giving up their missile or nuclear uh, capabilities. Dr. Pinkson, I wanted to ask, if I may, the situation internally in North Korea. Uh, there is virtually no chance when we talk about regime change. Uh, it may work in other countries, but from everything I've read, uh, there's virtually no chance that uh, that the regime could ever, or at least now, be overthrown. But what might happen in 10 or 20 years down the road if, if poverty continues, if people are, uh, feel that they have nothing to lose, and as they uh, come into more and more contact with the outside world? Well, I, I like to call North Korea the almost perfect dictatorship. I can't call it the perfect dictatorship because dictatorships are inherently flawed, and I don't think they can be sustained forever. But as far as the institutional design and the control of the state and the barriers to rebellion, uh, against the dictator, it's it's almost perfect. It's it's really incredible. So um, they can be around for a long time. The Kim family regime can be around for a long time. Marshall Kim is a young man. I think he probably has some health issues. But with any uh, family dynasty, it can't be sustained forever. And unless there's a, a Kim family heir who happens to have the personality traits of Kim Jong-un, who's a great dictator, then uh, it's going to be difficult to pass uh, uh, this system down to a fourth generation. And if uh, someone were to replace Kim Jong-un because he cannot rule, then that uh, leader or committee of rulers or what have you uh, has to establish his uh, legitimacy and if he's not a Kim, he can't base it upon the Kim family a legacy. 
So then I think it be, can become much more unstable. So this is the advantage for the outside world. We can uh, play the long game. There's no need to panic. The good news is that uh, the Kim family regime, the North Korean regime is very rational. They're hyper rational. They're secular. They wish to survive and they can be deterred. And we have all kinds of advantages in uh, deterring North Korea. So it's not true that it's a crazy, insane regime. You don't buy that. Oh, really? As far as human beings go, the North Korean leadership, those are, that's got to be the most rational humans you can find on the planet. If you're irrational, you wouldn't survive in that system. You wouldn't make it to the top. What about the leadership in Washington? The United States is undergoing a, a, an extraordinary leadership crisis that exacerbates this problem. That's being polite, maybe. <laughs> uh, I wanted to... Yes, yes come in. Dictators are not uh, nice guys. You don't host them for a Shabbat uh, dinner. What do you think? <laughs> Winter is coming. I don't know. But uh, Kim Jong-un is, I would say, more talented than his father and, uh, and his uh, uh, grandfather. And uh, if he's a, he's a family guy. And if his uncle uh, causes a problem, he kills the, the uncle. If his half brother, so for him, if he he feel if he feels that there is a threat uh, on his uh, uh, on his uh, row, he will kill every, he will kill anyone that might be. For, let's say if the Americans or the Chinese would say we have a new leader in North Korea, he would eliminate them uh, the next morning. Let me ask you, if I may. Um, North Korea has accused Israel of allowing the United States to control the Middle East uh, from this new uh, air defense base in the Negev. Um, even said the Pentagon wants to dominate the world and that Israel is a party to it. Um, in April, uh, the North Korean leadership threatened to mercilessly punish Israel after Avigdor Lieberman said some uh, unkind things about the little rocket man, I mean Kim Jong-un. Yeah. Um, really now, how much of a threat is North Korea to us here in Tel Aviv? Um, <laughs> well, there's no direct uh, threat. There's an in indirect threat. Uh, they, they pay attention to Israel, which shows that uh, we rule the world. It's the opposite way, not the Americans rule the world. But uh, uh, there's an indirect threat by, by selling uh, the missiles to the Arab states, the uh, nuclear stuff to the Arab states. But they don't, uh, although, uh, let's say, in 1973, North Korean pilots were fighting alongside with the Syrian and the Egyptians, uh, there, uh, there are indications that uh, the North Korean soldiers are still fighting in Syria, helping uh, the Assad regime. Uh, but it's not, it's not that big threat, a uh, direct threat. But we are concerned that, uh, as I said, technologies are flowing from, from North Korea to, uh, through Iran, to, to Syria, to Hezbollah, to Hamas. And, and, is, and is this a financial issue? Because as the yeah. sanctions yeah. start hurting, they need, to, uh, they need to find uh, additional sources of revenue? That's the beauty in North Korea. They don't have any, uh, the only ideology is if you're paying cash, we're going to sell it for you. So for them, they don't, they don't have any intention of, uh, let's say, spreading the Shia ideology uh, all around the world. For them, uh, it, it doesn't matter if you're uh, Myanmar, if you are, let's say, if the Americans will want to buy, we're going to... Business is business. Business is business. business. Oh, okay. Just yeah, no, cash. But I, I fully agree, and that's what makes North Korea very dangerous, because it's all about the money. There's no ideology, there's no religion, there's, you know, no political affinity. It's whoever can pay in hard cash. And I mean, they built the reactor in Syria that was bombed. We know that this was a North Korean reactor that was being built. Um, there's cooperation, even in the nuclear realm, between Iran and North Korea. Uh, we know that there were Iranian scientists at least at one of the North Korean uh, nuclear tests in 2013. Um, so what were those scientists doing there? And if you think about the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, one big area that it doesn't cover is activities outside Iran. Um, it would make tremendous strategic sense for Iran to try to conduct part of its nuclear program in North Korea or to have massive North Korean help. It just makes strategic sense. And um, I was concerned during the Obama administration when I would, you know, ask questions every once in a while, and it seemed that the answers were, no, we have no indication of any cooperation of that type. And it seemed to me that they weren't really looking hard enough at that cooperation. 
Uh, in the Trump administration, um, we know that Pompeo has set up a special um, section that will be devoted to looking at those kinds of issues. And I think uh, uh, Trump even said in his speech that they will be focused very much on Iranian North Korean cooperation. So this is an important aspect. Let me just say one thing about President Trump. Um, obviously, highly, highly controversial. Um, inside the United States, the debates are sometimes on the verge of uh, hysteria. This is what I see on social media. But I have to say, as far as the proliferation threats in particular, Iran and North Korea, uh, but especially Iran, I think the Trump administration is actually going in the right direction. Um, it's, it's, it's very problematic because you have an administration that's going in the right direction, but the administration itself is highly controversial for many, many reasons. And this is causing the debate, the internal debate in the United States, from what I can see from, you know, looking at it from the outside, uh, to be uh, somewhat problematic. People aren't able to make that uh, distinction between the administration and the president especially, and the policies of this administration. And I think, you know, as long as this administration is running things and formulating policies, we have to be able to make that distinction and to look at policies and to talk about them in a serious way and not just to denounce everything coming out of the Trump administration because we, you know, so-called hate Trump. So I think yes. it's important in our debate. And then I'm going to open up the floor to questions. I have a couple more of my own. Uh, just, one, yes. just one comment. Yes. He's now in South Korea. Uh, am I right? Uh, there's no American ambassador in South Korea. Uh, the, the Trump administration didn't nominate people at the State Department and the Department of Defense, uh, especially on Asia. Uh, the Asia team is not yet uh, in the, Amer in the uh, Trump administration. So this is a, a huge problem for policymakers uh, towards Asia. So policy towards Asia. Uh, just a couple things, and then I'll get to questions. Um, in a recent ish interview with Bloomberg News, um, Yitzhak Ben Israel, former director of the IDF military R&D unit, said Israel's Iron Dome protected the country against 4,500 Hamas missiles fired from Gaza in 2015, with not a single casualty. That was quite different from the last, uh, 2014, quite different from the last time around, and that the same technology could uh, potentially protect South Korea from the north, but that it would need many more missile batteries uh, simply because uh, the North Korean army is that much more vast. Um, given that, uh, is Israel currently supplying such batteries to South Korea and Japan, and if not, should it be? Uh, this is our <laughs> wish come true. It's a dream come true. We hope, we, we're trying to sell to the South Koreans, we're trying to sell to the Japanese, but we have a small problem, which is called the, the U.S. administration. Uh, the U.S. administration wants to sell its own system, Pac-3, and the other system, they want to deploy the THAAD. Uh, uh, in the case of the South Korean, uh, the biggest concern is not missiles, it's artillery. Uh, the, the thousands of uh, artillery cannons from North Korea. Uh, if the Japanese or the uh, South Korean want to buy, just call the, uh, the Israeli administration. They, want, they, they open. They, so uh, business is business. Business is business. Okay. business, okay. business. The only problem, because we have uh, uh, US technologies in this system, we need the approval of the Americans, and the Americans uh, would prefer not to approve. Dr. Benson, I wanted to, one second please, and my last question. I wanted to ask you, if I may, about opposition in South Korea to what's going on. Not everybody in South Korea is on board with this uh, aggressive policy, and I'm sure you have thousands of students who are demonstrating against these policies. They don't want these anti-missile systems in place. Uh, what about local opposition? To, you said aggressive policies, which policies are opposition to what? To, to, to the north. Uh, uh, I understand that they are enemies, they've never signed a, a, a peace treaty, two countries are still technically at war, and yet uh, uh, you have uh, students who have protested violently against the U.S. presence in South Korea for years. Well, it's interesting. I could, I could go on for a couple hours, give a whole lecture on so I'm going to get very, very short. But the, the, the historical legacy causes some distortions in the public debate and the public discourse on national security policy issues because of the, the military regimes in the, the past year, um, national security law that um, 
events access to most uh, the North Korean uh, news and information. People are very busy in their school life and preparing for an exam, getting into college and work, getting jobs, employment, all of these kinds of things. And many of the uh, national security I issues uh, require expertise and, and uh, specialization to understand the technical aspect, the political aspects of it. And uh, in the past, many people distrust the um, uh, National Intelligence Service. And there's not, uh, there, that lack of trust prevents a healthy uh, debate and building a consensus on these uh, national security policy issues. So that's kind of a, a, path, a pathology in uh, South Korean society. Okay, um, we have a lot of questions. Just remember, please state your name and your affiliation if you have one. Um, ask a question, don't make a rambling statement, or I'll go to the next one. And uh, <laughs> keep the questions brief, and please let, let us know who you're addressing your questions to. Yes, sir. I'm Michael Danby, a Member of Parliament from Australia. My first question is to Dr. Pinkerton. What's next uh, if another North Korean uh, ICBM is shot over Japan? Uh, would the option be to shoot it down, and what would be the reaction from North Korea if uh, one of the THAADs was deployed for that effect? And to Dr. Landau, um, what's to stop the North Koreans um, sending one of those long-range engines or ICBMs to Iran and supplying them? Is there any evidence of that happening? We saw uh, the deputy head of North Korea in Iran for 10 days before they started this, these missile shoots. And by the way, they can't just threaten the United States. They've specifically threatened to nuke Australian cities too. Okay. Do you want to get a question? Maybe take uh, someone. Uh, no, no, no. Let's let's answer that question. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can't get off of that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, that. Uh, do you want to start? Uh, do you want to start with that? Okay. On, on the shoot down, I think that was the question, right? If there's a, a long range missile test, the the geography matters, and it's difficult to get a shot at it. Um, the Pac-3 systems in, in uh, Japan and in South Korea would intercept the missiles in the terminal phase or the THAAD battery in the, the terminal phase. So if it's a long-range missile, it's difficult, if not impossible, to get a, a chance to intercept it. The best time to intercept the, the missiles would be in boost phase, when they're slow and they're, they're uh, being launched and the engines are still burning. But the geography makes that difficult. But recently I've heard in the U.S., they're working on a, a system uh, of uh, UAVs that can loiter uh, close to the launch sites, or at least close enough to get a shot uh, at the missiles in their boost phase. So that would, um, you know, resolve a lot of problems uh, surrounding the debris. Or if you miss, you know, there are other issues related to that debate. If they try to shoot it down and missed. Where, where does the uh, interceptor fall? Does it fall in Chinese territory? Then you have a problem. Or if you miss, it reveals some weaknesses in the missile defense system. So there are a lot of issues that have to be um, considered if you're going to try to intercept other missiles. Yeah, but if you intercept the, the missile on the boosting phase on uh, North Korean soil, North Korean could say, this is a casus belli and we should start uh, the war. So it's a, it's, a, it's very problematic. Uh, it might be easy in Israel, but it's difficult. Uh, in there are risks. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Emily. Oh, I'm Emily. sorry. Oh, yes. You said long range missiles. Sorry about that. No, I, I mean, these, this is exactly what I was referring to when I said that there, I, it makes sense for Iran to be cooperating with North Korea. Um, and therefore, there's reason to believe that they're trying to do it. And yes, there are these visits that keep happening, and I'm sure they're discussing these issues. Um, and I would like to see not only the Trump administration, but others as well, uh, starting to uh, pay attention to this and, and thinking about ways to cooperate uh, with the you know, the different intelligence communities and get a handle on what's going on and, and try to stop it. But for all of that to happen, the, the, the first stage is to understand that the JCPOA is not working, right? We keep hearing that the deal is working because Iran is more or less upholding the minimal concessions 
that they said they would make. Why wouldn't they uphold them? The deal is not bad from Iran's point of view. So all of this rhetoric that the deal is working, what does that mean the deal is working? It's not preventing Iran from becoming a nuclear state. It's just not. First and foremost, it has an expiration date. Um, and so I think there needs to be an understanding that there are problems here. And then start looking at the different areas. And cooperation with North Korea is definitely one of the, the issues that needs to be attended to. Including um, ballistic missiles. Uh, in, of course, including ballistic missiles. Look, the whole issue that ballistic missiles were not part of the negotiation with Iran and not part of the deal is ludicrous, okay? This was a concession that was made to Iran. Iran says ballistic missiles are non-nuclear. That's a ludicrous statement, okay? In order to have a working nuclear weapon, you need the fissile material, you need to know how to make a warhead, and you need the delivery mechanism. It's very simple. So by definition, ballistic missiles cannot be deemed non-nuclear. But Iran, of course, didn't want them to be part of the negotiations because this way, they, you know, they've done the secret work on the warhead, they're continuing with their ballistic missile program, and so they've delayed a little bit uh, the working on the fissile material because they, they already made great advances there. Um, and so ballistic missiles, of course, need to be part of uh, the conversation on Iran. The, the strange thing is, again, and I come back here to the Trump administration, I think that it actually took an administration like the Trump administration that is co so controversial, that is willing to, you know, do these things that many consider, you know, so uh, uh, terrible, to really shake things up and to get, we already see indications in Europe and in the wider uh, U.S. debate, people are admitting that this deal is flawed. They weren't doing that a year ago. A year ago, everything was perfect. Now you hear the, the Iran deal supporters say, yes, there are problems with the deal, but before they didn't even say that, you know, first part. Yes, there are problems with the deal. Well, I hope so, the Trump administration is listening. Um, well, we've got, I, I think it's actually made progress in that respect, ironically, perhaps. Yes. <coughs> My name is Gershon Zohar. I'm a veteran of Israeli Foreign Service and also past ambassador to Thailand. <coughs> uh, I'm very happy that you are dealing with all these issues today. I will be brief. But I think what's missing in the public discourse and the political international are actually reasons for the motivation of uh, North Korea to militarize uh, at large, uh, including nuclearization. And here I'm very happy to have Dr. Pinkston on board, and my question is to him, to you, sir. What is actually the motivation? Uh, a part of the obvious self-preservation of the regime in North Korea. That's what we should have deal with before we talk about present time and what we, the world will manipulate and maneuver with the situation in the future. And, one, uh, and just one point to make on that. I think that the inevitable comparison all of us make between the situation in North Korea and Iran is nearly totally inaccurate. Totally inaccurate. The reasons for militar uh, militarization and nuclearization of the two cases are nearly entirely different. Comparison is bad. So, and here I come to you, Dr. Pinkston, if you would be able to share with us what is the actual motivation, and all of us know that it great, goes to great extent to the historical emergence of the North Korean regime. It goes to the, South, uh, to the Korean War, and what practically and there are fears that uh, South Korea, one or another, can take over, not in a military way, of North Korea. Good question. As Thank being you. an economic superpower. Yeah. So if you think that in practical terms, China and even South Korea even more, not in nuclear means, can do in order to control and to balance the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay, on the, the motivations for North Korea and the nuclear weapons program. It serves multiple purposes for the leadership. It serves as a deterrent, and it also serves as a, a symbol of uh, power. It fits into their narrative about the world and the world view. If you analyze 
North Korean ideology. It's an amalgamation of different belief systems based on uh, Lenin's theory of capitalist imperialism, for example. They view the international system as uh, menacing and imperialistic. That's a fixed constant in the international system. They view themselves as uh, victims and a target of invasion. They are also, in political science terms, the ultimate realists. Everything is about power. They believe everything is uh, uh, determined through uh, power and the balance of power. And also internally in domestic politics, everyone is socialized in a system where no one can make credible commitments. So any other pathway to security through alliances or collective security system or, or cooperative security system, some kind of uh, negative security assurances that were offered through diplomacy and everything, that is absolutely not credible. It's unacceptable. It violates all of their worldviews and their ideological principles. So they are the ultimate believers in self-help, but the only way to survive is to have your own uh, nuclear weapons program, your own nuclear deterrent. Did either of you want to comment? Yeah. Follow up on that? Well, I think there was sort of a backhanded to me. Uh, I, I think I said very carefully that Iran and North Korea are very different in very in, in many respects. Where they are similar is that they are both determined nuclear proliferators. And they present a challenge to the international community as far as turning that around and bringing them back to the fold of the NPT. And in this respect, they are very similar. They present the same challenge, and therefore I make the comparison because the problems that we see in diplomacy and facing North Korea are the same problems that are emerging also in dealing with Iran. We see that negotiated deals for a determined proliferator are, uh, you know, turn into deals that the proliferator wants to leverage in order to continue on with its proliferation, not to denuclearize or not to roll back their nuclear program. So they present a similar ch arms control challenge or non-proliferation challenge to the international community. Did you want to comment on that? I agree with that all the time. <laughs> Good. <Okay. laughs> um, I have to ask you to keep your questions brief and please no statements, just a question. Yes, sir, please. Uh, my name is Aaron Langarden. Um, I, um, I think it was Herman Kahn that said that nuclear strategy uh, involves people thinking about the unthinkable. And in that light, I would like to ask this question. <coughs> Militarily, is it possible for the United States to launch a preemptive attack against uh, North Korean military forces using uh, nuclear weapons, and in so doing, uh, against the forces that endanger South Korea, American, f American citizens in South Korea, and Japan? And is it possible to do it with nuclear weapons, which are of a low enough yield to prevent radiation uh, injuries to South Korea, Japan, <coughs> and American citizens in, uh, in South Korea? Wow. Uh, no, it's, it's, easy, it's easy to start a war. Uh, it, it's not, it doesn't end after 45 minutes, so. Uh, the, look, at, look at the threat that uh, uh, South Korea has. It's the thousands of uh, uh, artillery cannons along the DMC. Uh, you have uh, missile launchers spread all around South Korea. Let's say you have the tunnels that... Uh, in South Korea or North, North uh, Korea? In North Korea. In North Korea, yeah. yeah. So you have to bombard all these. Oh, uh, uh, it will take uh, at least a few days to, if you're using not nuclear weapon, if you're a conventional weapon, it will take at least a few, uh, I'll say, a few weeks to, to bombard all these sites. Plus, uh, what will prevent North Koreans invade uh, uh, South Korea? Uh, we're talking about, at least in the, uh, the first two weeks, about 900,000 casualties. He's an American, he is in South Korea. Okay, I should address that question. I think there has to be some clarification about preemption and, and preventive prevention. Preemptive strike is the, the use of military force 
to destroy an imminent attack before it gets underway. You have the right to do that to protect yourself uh, against an imminent attack. Prevention is destroying uh, capability before it comes to fruition or to neutralize a military capability. People talk about the casualties or the immediate effects, but I think the after effects, the geopolitics after that, if the U.S. were to do that, it would be over for the United States. It would be a pariah state. It would be expelled from the region. No one in the region wants them here. It would be the end of the San Francisco treaty system. It would be the end of the U.S. influence in the world. The U.S. would be relegated to a regional uh, power and pariah state. The world would look uh, very different. Absolute disaster. And yes. China would intervene also. Uh, Andy Friedman from Tutspeed Press Service. The, the one word that hasn't come up this morning that I would have expected is Russia. Um, Russia has uh, the, a unique space in which they have close relations with Israel, with Iran, and with North Korea. Um, so I wonder what your take is. Number one, what influence does, does Moscow have with North Korea? And number two, what, what, are, what are Russia's interests in, in this space? Uh, it's an open question to all three of you. Thank you. Uh, Russia, uh, if you compare Russia to China, China is, is, uh, is more important in the region. Uh, and sometimes what the Russians are saying is, we are, we are agreeing with China because uh, uh, it allows them to be a uh, more important player in the region. Uh, China, uh, Russia would say, uh, would say uh, let me phrase it, North Korea is the best chess player in the region. Uh, it knows how to play, it knows how to manipulate Russia, China, the United States, South Korea, and the six-party talks, they were, they were A, A plus uh, uh, players. Uh, Russia is not that dominant player in the region. Uh, it focuses mainly on, on, on Europe. China and North Korea does not see it as an influential player, uh, but it, it, it uses or uses or try to uh, engage with Russia if it wants to pressure China. But uh, I wouldn't create a link between Moscow, Tel Aviv, and Pyongyang. Uh, it's, it's not that influential. We, we control the world, but not that much. <laughs> so, so in other words, if, if, if Israel wanted to... Um, Israel's diplomatic channel to, to try and affect change in Pyongyang would be via Beijing, would be via Beijing rather than via Moscow. I wish uh, because it doesn't work even uh, with Beijing. But our leverage is not is not that big. In, in the old days, you mentioned the, the Foreign Office. Uh, we tried to make a deal with with the North Koreans. It was uh, the Foreign Office versus the Mossad. Uh, the ego game, but I wouldn't uh, talk about this. Uh, because it's, it's a sensitive issue, but we tried to negotiate directly with them. And the Americans said, go away, this is our region, this is our zone. Uh, so Israel, I wish we were able to convince uh, Beijing or to, to convince Moscow to put the pressure on, on, uh, on Pyongyang, but it doesn't work. Yes, in the back, please. Uh, Shalom Sherman, University of Haifa, and Tom G. Tashua in Shanghai. Uh, would it be possible to remove the obstacles that have been put by the Americans as far as China is concerned? And if the Americans follow Kissinger's advice, namely, hands off Ukraine, this is for Russia, and hands off Korea, this is for China. And so Korea, you say Korea, you mean North Korea or South Korea? I mean both, and of course South Korea. In other words, in the long run, the solution to the problem that the whole world has with North Korea is probably reunification of Korea. And this will be possible if the Chinese agree to it, and they will agree to it if the <coughs> Americans are out of the Chinese Sea. Out of the Chinese Sea? Yes, yeah. all the Chinese Sea, the North Chinese Sea and the South Chinese Sea. you're saying? Uh, we have, we have uh, messages from uh, Southeast Asia here. Uh, would they agree with you that uh, the Americans should go off? Uh, uh, would they agree with you that the Chinese are playing a fair play? Uh, how, how harmonizing? It, it, uh, we talked about law. According to the uh, international law, 
uh, so, uh, some of the items that the Chinese are saying it's theirs. Uh, what you are presenting is a Chinese, it, it's a Beijing policy. Uh, yeah. let's, let's drop the, well, the Australians don't, don't like you, but, uh, <laughs> but if, uh, let's, a matter of love. Let's, uh -huh. uh, if, let's skip the, the Americans. Talk to, talk to the South Koreans. Talk to the uh, people from Vietnam. Talk to people. Uh, what's what's Vietnam the biggest threat? Is it the U.S.? No, it's it's, it's the Chinese threat. If you talk to Southeast uh, other other uh, other places in, in Southeast Asia, uh, let's uh, let's talk to India. What's India's the biggest threat? Is it the U.S. or is it uh, uh, the, the Chinese? I'm, I'm not saying uh, if the Americans would go home. What some of the we mentioned, but some of the students in South Korea say. Americans, go home and please take us with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, but but, but what, what I'm saying is uh, this is this is one policy of saying we, we, we blame on uh, on the Americans. The Americans are uh, responsible. They are uh, they have a responsibility. But uh, the, the the biggest concern now in Asia is the the withdrawal uh, of the United States. What does it mean to Asian states? He, he's an Australian. Uh, uh, the, the Australians are concerned what's going on with China. What's Chinese policy? Is it harmony or is it domination uh, in a, with a soft power or with a hard power? You have doubt about it? Uh, I have one doubt, but it's, <laughs> it's a religious issue. <laughs> Dr. Bateson, what do you say about that? Well, there, there was a lot of um, uh, information in, in the back and forth there, so I have to uh, be selected. As far as the uh, American role in international institutions and the liberal world order. The, the Trump administration seems to be um, uh, withdrawing from that or having a little interest in that. People in the region are concerned about China, but comparatively speaking, uh, Russia, the point about Russia and North Korea, of course, Russia is very uh, displeased with the nuclear test very close to its border. They're displeased with any um, uh, belligerence by North Korea that causes instability. But the fact of North Korea being a spoiler, uh, that seems to be a win for Russia. They seem to be uh, seeking any kind of uh, instability vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., whether it's NATO or the EU or North Korea causing problems or causing disunity in the United States and confusion with their information operations and so forth. They're propping up uh, North Korea in some ways, and, and uh, trade is picking up. Uh, they've forgiven uh, uh, debt, about 10 billion rubles in debt from North Korea. So, um, so that's a, a problem as well. Okay, we have time for only a couple yeah. more questions. Um, well, now it's quiet. <laughs> yes, yes, with me. Yes, you, Mir Bendo. Uh, I want to spoil this party a little bit. Let's go, let, let's go, what, what happens the day after, because I think this, this problem is maybe insoluble. What happens the day after? I'm looking at the West, uh, West Germany, East Germany reunification. I think it's a huge uh, economic boom for Korea and the whole region. What happens next? Let's, let's ask uh, Dr. Pinkton first and then give you the others. So what ha the question is, for those that are under, what happens after reunif reunification if in how fact... How does it come about? What happens? How does it happen and what does that do for the economy of the, of the region, right? Yes, yes. Dr. Pinkston, please. Well, I think the question is related to an estimate. We're talking about uh, future outcomes. <laughs> so, you know, I can't, I can't predict the future. Any, any kind of estimate would be based on some underlying assumptions on what took place or what caused unification. Is it peaceful? Is it through uh, violence? Is there an insurgency? Is, is WMD used? Is chemical weapons used? Um, you know, is there uh, international cooperation and support? I mean, there's just, it could be a broad uh, range of outcomes based on the assumptions. Yeah, I agree. I agree, it's too hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And it's very expensive. This is why it is estimated that it will, t uh, it will cost between five to ten trillion dollars to unify the the Korean Peninsula. It depends on how fast you want to develop uh, the North Korean side of the of the Korean Peninsula. Is it peaceful or it, uh, after a war? Uh, it's it, it's very complicated. Uh, would it be? Would it be? Uh, I'll give you just an example. Uh, okay, I wouldn't sell the Canadians, but someone said that uh, we obey what the Americans are saying. This is one the Canadians said. But uh, the big question is, will a unified Korea, now they're trying to say that the unified Korea 
would be independent. And if we go back to, to the, to the uh, question about China, would it be tilts towards China, or, uh, or would it tilt towards the United States, or would the South Queen would prefer we're an independent state when, and we're not dependent on anyone? Uh, the South Queen are very concerned of the implications of unified uh, Korea because of the economic burden of a unified uh, state. It's a, it's it's they they support it. Uh, if you talk to South Korean, they support the unification of Korea, but unofficially they would say that's delayed in a uh, two or three or five decades. The West Germans felt the same and they worked out great for them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, it is estimated that uh, uh, in the long run, by 2050, uh, uh, the G uh, GDP of, of, of the unified Korea would be 70,000 70, uh, US dollars. I'd like to point out. Uh, which means that. Uh, we can ask them uh, when we reach this. Uh, if I may point out, though, in the case of East and West Germany, the disparity between East and the West was not that great. It was great, but North Korea, South Korea is the world's most wired economy. Uh, everybody's uh, online. It's it's a hugely prosperous. South and North Korea is, is the least wired in the world. Yeah, well, some of some of the uh, North Korean came to South Korea. They said this is not a Korean state. This is a, a Western state. Uh, and another problem is that in, in the case of in case of Germany, uh, on every uh, one East German, there were four uh, uh, West Germans. In the case of Korea, it's uh, it's adding another fifty percent of the population. It's a huge problem, not not just economically, but socially, education. Uh, but he mentioned that this is a, a wonderful authoritarian uh, state. Uh, I don't recommend going uh, for a holiday, but uh, they, you have to. Uh, uh, deal with the brainwashed of, uh, of 25 million people that were uh, used to uh, an authoritarian regime coming back to South Korea and uh, living in a, a democratic society. Yes, please. I'm Perry Newman. The question is to uh, the gentleman in uh, Seoul. Um, you, you mentioned that if the US uh, hit North Korea, whether preemptively or preventatively, it would be all over for the US and the region. Um, if North Korea managed to hit one of the U.S. allies, be it Australia, uh, Japan, South Korea, would it also be all over for the U.S. in Asia? No, that's it's very different. So, uh, preemptive preemptive use of force would would be legitimate because it's a. Uh, it, Oh, okay, sorry, continue. Yeah, okay. Yes. So, in, in, in the case of an imminent attack, and North Korea is, is uh, planning and initiating uh, an attack, and a preemptive use of force is used to thwart that attack, that's legitimate use of force. If North Korea lashes out, and South Korea, the U.S., and its allies respond against that aggression to to reestablish deterrence, and if they cannot establish deterrence to uh, to defeat the aggression, that's a legitimate use of force under international law and under other uh, uh, statutory laws, constitutional laws in South Korea, for example. So that's legitimate. But preventive use of force without any North Korean aggression or provocation, uh, it's not legitimate under international law. It's not politically acceptable in the region. And uh, nobody wants to see that. Can I will they support? That? Okay. Yes, please add something, and uh, and yeah. then we'll wrap it up. Yes. Okay. Oh. No, I just want to say something on that deterrent relationship. I think uh, <coughs> one of the fears in those states that you mentioned, Japan, South Korea, uh, in the new situation where North Korea will be able to strike the U.S. mainland. Of course, the U.S. has guarantees to these. Right? There's some kind of nuclear umbrella there. But I think they'll be starting to ask themselves whether, if Chicago's on the line, whether the U.S. will even respond if there is an attack on Japan or South Korea. That's the new issue that's coming onto the agenda. Because as long as the U.S. can't be uh, hit, it's one type of nuclear umbrella. But if uh, the U.S. mainland is vulnerable, I would say that uh, you know there will be serious questions being asked, and they're already being asked in North Korea and Japan. After those long-range ballistic South Korea. in South Korea, yeah. after those long-range uh, missile tests for in <coughs> July, Prime Minister of Japan was on the phone very quickly to Trump to talk about that. 
And Trump said, don't worry, I'm pushing the buttons. But uh, I, I just want to make it more complicated. Uh, let's take one, one short scenario. When uh, North Korea fired Kwasong-14 towards the United States, and there was a, there's a problem with the missile, and it falls on Tokyo. And it falls on the emperor's uh, uh, house. Would it start a war? Uh, even if the North Korean didn't intend to start a war. This will make it very complicated. And what Emily said, the South Korean and the Japanese are asking, is the, uh, the, the US committee as solid as it was? And should we, in the future, consider having a nuclear uh, And they're starting to talk about that. Although uh, the South Korean president said uh, a few days ago, no nuclear weapon in South Korea. I'm being told we have no more time for questions. Uh, don't forget to fill out raffle tickets for a free one-way ticket to Pyongyang. It's <laughs> your uh, <laughs> panelists. Thank you very much for coming.